It was a strange action figure from the 1990 wave of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like Usagi Yojimbo, the character had his own comic book and could have made his animated debut in the Fred Wolf cartoon. Unfortunately, this never happened. But who was this character? And how did it end up in the Playmates toy line? Today, I will cover Panda Khan, the leader of the Brotherhood of Pan. In the early 1980s, Dave Garcia made an oil painting showcasing a valiant panda warrior. This character, which he affectionately named Panda Khan, was the leader of the Brotherhood of Pan. Much to Monica Sharp's surprise, Dave presented her with this painting on Valentine's Day. Initially, Dave envisioned Panda Khan as a lone Avenger. Inspired by the concept, both Dave and Monica delved deep into its development. Eager to give the idea more substance, Monica sourced books on Chinese mythology and art, aiding Dave's creative process. Among the trove of books Monica brought home, one particular reference stood out. It mentioned a legend about the prehistoric black-haired people who worshipped a deity named Pong Ku, the creator of all things. This led to a captivating twist in the narrative. The fictional god Pan evolved into Pan Ku. The world first saw Panda Khan in 1983, when he was featured in Richard Harris's fanzine Fantasy. He soon graced the pages of Tyro, an inner fan showcase. Although Dave and Monica engaged with several small comic book companies, it wasn't until Warp Graphics offered them some connections that Panda Khan found a wider audience. By the summer of 85, he was featured in Colleen Doran's A Distant Soil. From issues 6 to 9, Panda Khan was allotted 8 pages. But unfortunately, after Warp tried to claim copyright and trademark over Colleen Doran's stories, the artist left the company, and the series was axed before Panda Khan's story could reach its conclusion. This setback did not deter Dave and Monica. Bolstered by encouragement from their peers, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, they embarked on self-publishing under the banner of Abacus Press. They revisited the earlier material, infusing it with missing visual details, which had been previously omitted due to Warp's consideration of colorizing the series. The comic, set to be released quarterly in 1987, showcased a deep appreciation for authenticity. Dave and Monica opted for Mandarin Chinese in naming characters rather than relying on the romanization of pinyin. This linguistic choice led to unique pronunciations, such as Jing Chai and Yo Shao. A unique feature was introduced in the inaugural issue. The pandas communicated through sign language. This decision highlighted their evolutionary journey, suggesting they gained consciousness before vocal communication. Notable characters included Shi Bo, a Japanese man with striking kabuki makeup and bioengineered pandas that towered over their terrestrial ancestors, some standing close to 8 feet tall. This incredible growth spurt was attributed to rapid adaptation, an outcome of hostile environments combined with the manipulative touch of biodesign. While color could have added depth to the illustrations, Dave Garcia refrained because he was colorblind. As the series progressed, life ushered in changes for its creators. After the fourth issue, Monica was keen on returning to teaching, and Dave found himself engrossed in freelance projects. Their decision to conclude the series with a special edition was influenced by waning orders and parenting challenges. Despite receiving positive reviews, sales dwindled, not meeting the industry benchmarks of the time. But there was another traumatizing event that Panda Khan had problems overcoming, the black and white speculation bubble of the mid-80s. This bubble began after the success of the Ninja Turtles. Since indie comics had very low print runs, they were quickly seen as commodities. This led to artificial demand based on speculation, thinking that any black and white comic could be the next Ninja Turtles. The number of independent publishers went from 10 to 170 by the end of 1987. Unfortunately, many of the books inspired by the Turtles' popularity were too derivative. Adult thermonuclear samurai elephants, geriatric gangrene jujitsu gerbils, adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters, and more examples like that. Many superhero and fantasy comics that didn't come with either good art or story flooded the market. Some indie publishers came out of nowhere, suddenly selling many titles a month. And you have to remember that the Ninja Turtles became a collector's item mainly because of its low print run. 
At the boom's peak, indie titles went from printing 10,000 copies to 200,000 copies. Collectors stopped investing in these comics, and comic shop owners found themselves with many copies they couldn't sell. This led to the demise of publishers and comic shops all over the United States. Returning to PandaCon, Monica attributed the drop in orders to comic shop owners' apprehensions about stocking anthropomorphic black and white comics. In any case, these are the chronicles of PandaCon. Please keep in mind that I don't speak Mandarin, so don't take my pronunciations too seriously. In the midst of global dominance, Pan-Asia, propelled by its thriving economy, established its colonies beyond Earth, leaving behind a planet grappling with environmental degradation. But they would return, governing these space territories from a biosphere-based Earth. They undertook an initiative, tasking their brightest minds to reintroduce and tailor-make Earth species for life on far-off planets. As humanity stretched its presence across galaxies, some resisted the established order. These renegades, often pirates, journeyed between celestial bodies in their vessels. In this interstellar expansion, the clandestine division responsible for genetic innovations, biodesign of Central Lab, settled discreetly on a secluded planet named Datu, which is Mandarin for Great Earth. This planet, housing the Pan-Asian Institute of Biodesign, became a hotbed of intrigue. Shibo, the genetic chief, and Captain Lau, a spaceship captain, were secretly making deals with hunters to extract specimens, notably pandas that were meant for zoological gardens. Shibo also harbored another interest, harnessing the hidden psychic powers within humans with his eye amplifier of his own making. Panku, the Institute's director, held a unique bond with a panda named Bo Ye, a creation sharing his very DNA. But a fabricated warning of pirate Tong raiders and pending attack on his facility reached him. Knowing that the most important thing was for the pirates not to get their hands on him, he ordered Bo Ye to take the other pandas to the lowest levels. The base's AI, Jin 1000, would signal them when it was safe to come up again. Banku also ordered the AI to guard the planet during his absence. The director armed the computers and ruined the clandestine hunting plans. Jin 1000 destroyed the Tong, but it couldn't kill Shibo, as he still retained his biodesign protected status. 500 years after the significant events in Datu, the planet remained shielded from Sol's view. Throughout this era, the Panda Brotherhood, devoted disciples of Pan, come to prominence. Emerging from obscurity, the pandas realized their homeland had metamorphosed. Estranged by their fellow bearkin, these peace-loving pandas found shelter at the foot of Wukongshan, the Caterpillar Mountains. There they prayed to their god, Panku. Panku answered, asking them to fortify the caverns and dwell within, to teach their children the lore and craft of the Brotherhood. And the strongest and wisest of all of them would be Khan. The pandas evolved, and their cave city became a fortress. They became legendary warriors, and they prospered and waited for Panku's return. Panku's sporadic visits to the lineage of the initial Panda Khan were special. They coincided with the Tian Chu Men Festival, marking the moment young panda warriors, named the Hei Ba, ventured out of Wukong for the first time. However, as the Brotherhood quelled their adversaries, the Ursai, and began to lead untroubled lives, Panku's visits ceased. This raised concerns among the pandas. Some speculated that their newfound contentment might have displeased their deity, or that they might have lost his favor. As another Tian Chu Men dawned, a sense of apprehension permeated. In this epoch, the reigning panda Khan was Li Yang, with General Kumoyo, commonly known as Kumo, helming the high pies training for the past three decades. Master Shan was a spiritual leader who guided the Brotherhood of the Panda and the High Pai. Other main characters were the High Pai, like Yu Shou, Li Yang's nephew and historian, and Jing Chai, who was Yu's friend. She had a little sister named Su Lin, a little brother named Mei Lan, and a baby sibling named Shang. The cubs would frequently go on adventures with a lazy friend known as Fan Ye. As the pivotal moment of the Tian Chu Men approached, Yu and Jing had to pick their paths. Yu was driven by a thirst for enigmas, and so was drawn towards the south, hoping to unravel the secrets of the rivers. Contrarily, Jing wanted to go west, 
a direction promising wondrous escapades and thrilling tales. Unbeknownst to many, Chibo, once a mere mortal but now going by Lord Chibo, remained on the planet. The passage of time had not lessened his grievances. Instead, he transformed into a vengeful Lord of Death. Hunted by his past and eager to lure Panku back, he aimed his vengeance at Panku's beloved creations. Intending to make him return, he raised some zombie warriors to start an attack on the Caterpillar Mountains. The Young was worried. In his heart, he believed their divine protector's absence stemmed from their complacency. And since they defeated the Ursai, Yang felt they never had another glorious day. He felt like he was a soldier, not a philosopher, and he wanted to leave with the high Pai to find a new purpose in life. During the city's vibrant celebrations, chaos struck from above in the form of giant bats, and from the ground in the form of zombie warriors. Jing, trying to get bows to attack back, was attacked by one of those creatures, and she fell into the rapids that go under the city. Yu dived behind to help her. Far below the surface, Yu found Jing in a cavern. She'd sprained one of her arms and was a little afraid about the tales of Jin Jin Mushi, the earthquake beetle. After many earthquakes and missing high Pai, the pandas stopped sending people down there. So they were the first to walk those caverns in a very long time. They eventually ran into some giant insects, the Chikol. After mentioning Pangku, the insects recognized them as the Lord's children and guided them to Jin Shin Mushi. The AI we knew as Jin 1000 was behind the legend of the earthquake beetle. He in fact controlled the planet's earthquakes. Through Jin Shin, they discovered that the Chikol were his helpers. They were hard workers with almost no initiative, and they weren't good at conversation. Jin Shin felt relieved to finally have someone to have meaningful conversations with. But after discovering Shibo's magical attack, Jin Shin realized he needed to intervene. Back at the surface, the pandas used fireworks to fight against the undead. Master Shan took the cubs to a safe place and prayed for Panku's intervention. The Khan and Kumo faced Lord Shibo, but were quickly bested, thanks to Shibo's magical abilities. At that moment, Jin Shin created the illusion of Panku, distracting him. This allowed Master Shan to hit him and throw him off the cliff. With the Lord of Death gone, his army died. After the incident, Ching and Yu discovered they couldn't go back to the surface just yet. The tunnels collapsed behind them, so Jin Shin offered them to stay until the Chikul could repair the tunnels. Knowing that Jin Shin was a contemporary of Pang Ku, Yu felt this was an amazing opportunity to learn things. But being a panda of action, Jing didn't feel the same way. The next day, the soldiers started experimenting with one of the weapons introduced in the fight, a fusion blaster. Interested in it, the cubs, Mei and Su, got their hands on it, assisted by their friend, Fang Ye. At the tunnels, Cardin, a Chico guide, showed Jing around. She got distracted and ran into a viral biotic being that could replicate others. Jin Shin had plans for this new life form it invented, but now that the being was aggressive, it asked for Cardin and gave it some special blades for Jing. Jing defeated her mirror self, saving the day. Still, since mirror people reflected the nearest, strongest emotions and Jing had aggression in her, she was the cause of the whole incident. At the palace, Li Young decided to leave with the high Pai to search for either Shibo or Pangku. Shibo was in fact still alive and killed two scouts to replenish his energy. Meanwhile, Jin Shin detected a pirate Tong about to land in Datu. The crew of the Jade Remora didn't know of the existence of this planet. And after detecting life forms, they decided to land and perhaps take some of these for trade. Out there, three Ursai found the bodies of the dead scout pandas. This was witnessed by Xin, a magical changeling fox. The Ursai, in turn, were found by Shibo, who controlled them to guard his cocoon while he recovered on his way home. On their way, they were seen by Mei, Su, and Fan, who attacked them with the fission laser. This was too much for all of them to handle, and the gun ended up in possession of one of the Ursi. At the Jade Remora, Jade asked her first mate, Zhong, to prepare the shuttle to land. They would send two hunter teams while they worked on repairs to the Remora. Jin Shin, seeing how the ship threatened all his work, asked the Chikul to stop them. To guide them, he would send a mobile version of himself. 
Li Yang realized Xin was spying on them, and after catching him in his weak spot, the fox told them how he found the bodies and how they were killed with magic. Upon initial exploration, Jade realized Datu was very likely a seeded biosphere. Knowing that duplicates of old earth animals were bred there made this mission more valuable. They could finally clear the Remora's debt with someone named Cleaver. Two crew members, Fu and Dai Gu, ran into Ursai and captured two of them along with the cocoon and the gun. The three panda cubs now needed to recover it from the strangers. The cubs recovered the gun but were now trapped inside the shuttle. Yang, Xin, and other soldiers discovered the ships and planned to scare them away with the help of Xin, who impersonated a dragon. The two crew members found out they couldn't get inside their shuttle anymore and that pandas were inside. Surrounded, they were defeated, and Xin impersonated Dai Gu, which allowed him to assimilate his memories and language. They went inside the ship where they discovered the cocoon. At the palace after Pang Ku helped him defeat Lord Shibo, Master Shan was seen as the next Khan. Yu found a way out of the tunnels and planned to return to the surface with Jing. But after seeing the army of Chickles, Jing and Yu decided to follow them to the surface. Once there, they found out that the Chickle were not winning their battle against the pirates, and were actually in need of panda warriors. Yang and the rest left the Barracuda shuttle. This allowed the cubs to also leave in secret. The cocoon melted and Shibo realized he was now in a human ship. After being displeased with the computers not obeying him, he destroyed them. But this Kansa was already talking to Jin Qin and warned him about the presence of Shibo. The rest of the pirates were trying to escape the insects when they ran into the cubs. After hearing them talk, Jade realized she knew their dialect. They followed them and saved them from Shibo, whose mind control couldn't work on Jade as she had anti psi implants. Desperate, Shibo picked up the gun and tried to kill them, but was interrupted with the star by Khan. Khan was about to kill Shibo when Jin Shin interrupted him. It would take Shibo back to his lair to be imprisoned, and also punish the invaders. However, the cubs defended Jade, as she spoke their language and protected them from Shibo. Jin Shin spared the Tong after Li Yang convinced it that Pang Ku steered them to Datu to create the most daring Tian Chu men in the history of the Brotherhood. Now interested in finding Pang Ku again, Li Yang, Jin, and Jin Shin joined the crew of the Remora. Khan announced a Kendo tournament to find his successor, and it was then that Jing and Yu decided to stay at home to witness the Kendo tournament. Around this time, PandaCon joined the Turtles as an action figure. Having said that, despite appearing in some comics where the Turtles also appeared, the two properties never shared a story. After the story ended, PandaCon made appearances in other books. Since he was no longer the PandaCon, Li Yang became known as X Khan. Two stories showed PandaCon with the crew of the Remora. Convinced that Pang Ku left Datu, he offered his services to Jade, the captain, in exchange for passage off planet. Knowing a warrior like Khan would come in handy, she accepted. In their first mission, Zhang sent them to pay the Great Cleaver from the spaceport known as Marzipan to regain ownership of the Remora. This would put all their business with Cleaver to an end. But after seeing Li Yang, Cleaver reconsidered the terms of their agreement. He now wanted the payment plus X Khan. Yang agreed. And after Cleaver signed the payment, Khan got rid of him and recovered the payment. They had to deliver a package to a sinking capital in their second mission. Weapons more advanced than blades were forbidden there, so X-Khan was the obvious choice to go. On this planet, some humans paid to be surgically altered to look like creatures from Earth's past, like Sushi Q, the Queen of Summerson, who betrayed Jade before. Sushi Q changed into a mermaid, but her scientists were working on an elixir of life to speed cellular regeneration. After threatening Jade's life, Khan gave up, and they were jailed for future experimentation. However, Khan quickly freed himself, and then went to recover his Dragon's Claw, which he revealed was more than just a sword. It was his soul. Jade then used the elixir on Sushi Q, who grew out of control in a way that her city couldn't contain. There were other stories with Li Yang and the Brotherhood of the Panda. A notable one was In the Belly of the Golden Whale, printed in color for the Warp Graphics Annual Number 1. In this story, Shibo tried to destroy the Khan while he was traveling in a balloon. There were many pinups in different books. 
but the character would make two important appearances in Usagi Yojimbo number 21 and number 34. In the first story of these two, we get a flashback to the time when Lee Young was a hey bye, and with the help of Kumo, had to help scare the Ursai away from the city. The second story was a proper crossover with Usagi Yojimbo, in the same way Usagi crossed paths with the Turtles. He simply appeared in Dot 2, where he ran into Shibo, who was running from Lee Young. Shibo told Usagi that an Oni killed his magistrate, and then took on his form, running the village. Usagi asked Shibo to take him to his village. When the two met, they started fighting. However, Shibo felt neither of the two would end anytime soon, and raised an army of the undead. Usagi realized then that Panda Khan was an honorable warrior, and the two fought together. Once the menace was over, Usagi appeared back in his world. This story could have happened between issue 4 and the final special, or maybe it happened any time in the past, as Yang didn't really see Shibo at any point. In the Patrick Rabbit title, the PandaCon world made two appearances. The first one was in issue 4 of 1989. This story was set in Dot 2, but didn't include PandaCon, only Su Lin. In issue 7 of 1993, he appeared with the same outfit as the Playmates figure. The story implied that the bio on that action figure was true. X-Con came to Earth with the Tong and traveled to the past. Patrick Rabbit was another indie character created by Phil Ya, who lived in New York and had many adventures searching for the secret of creativity. The two met and Lee Young admitted that he had long known that fate had something else in store for him. That's why he didn't hesitate to join the Tong. Patrick took a tour of the Remora, and after he sat down, he accidentally transported the ship into the future of the planet Datu. That's back to Li Yang's period. There, they rescued Fang Ye and Su Lin from drowning. Li Yang realized that Patrick's books from the library were now 1,000 years overdue. Surprisingly, they received the visit of one of the librarians of the universe to take Patrick and the books back to their time. By the end of this story, Yang was left in the future and on the planet Datu but we can assume that he resumed his travels with Tong, seeking Pang Ku. But after that, Panda Khan completely disappeared from everywhere. As for the identity of the next Panda Khan, Monica intended to make Jing the next leader of the Brotherhood of Pan. But because she had to focus all her efforts on helping her son, who was diagnosed with autism with assorted learning disabilities and required specialists in therapy, the story was never completed, and all the effort paid off. Their son is an archaeologist now, Mickey Clausen, a friend of Dave Garcia, started doing recolorings of the original stories for fun. After seeing the results, Mickey, Dave, and Monica decided to make a Kickstarter for a colored reprint with a new nine-page story, introducing a new character, Ba Fu, a new arch nemesis created by Monica Sharp and Mickey Clausen. Ba Fu was a cloud jumper shepherd leading the mice to the low valleys to feed. But when they arrived, he discovered that the water received waste from a mine and the pollution started altering the mice. The angry mice made him fall into the water. The mice eventually returned to normal, but a machine powered on in their escape, reviving a creature. When this creature came out of the mine, it found a drowned Ba Fu, who quickly transformed into a monster. Since the success of this Kickstarter, Chapter 2 was also published in color. But more things would happen thanks to Clausen. He was working with John Robert Bryans from Galestone Media, was working on a new animated series called Action Mice. Clausen talked to Brian's about his work with Panda Khan, and after a year in 2020, Galestone Media, a Canadian company, acquired the rights to the character to use him on TV, comics, and video games. Before the acquisition of Panda Khan, Action Mice was going to be an animated streaming show for Amazon Prime. But once Panda Khan came onto the scene, the brains behind Galestone, John Robert Bryan's, Brian Lydiard and Marta Lydiard started working on the Anthroverse, a shared universe for many different anthropomorphic animal properties. The new PandaCon, Yoka, will have his own animated series for streaming, appearing first in the Action Mice series. Similarly to the Usagi Chronicles, the new show will not have characters from the comic books. It will be a brand new interpretation of the original concept. Since they decided not to have human characters in the shared universe, the whole PandaCon story had to be changed. They described Action Mice as G.I. Joe meets TMNT and Panda Khan as TMNT meets Samurai Jack. His first season is a story of redemption. 
three years after the fall of the Brotherhood of the Khan and the complete subjugation of the lands of Wukong by the evil overlord Shu Jin and the Tusk clan, a lone survivor is drawn into a conflict he's far from ready for. It's now up to the newest in a long line to hold the mantle of Panda Khan to rise, find the courage within, and with the help of five ragtag rebels, learn to unleash the Pandemonium. Panda Khan, Bamboo, Rascal, Wingsting, Grasp, and Rune are the last hope of Wukong, and the only hope to defeat Overlord Shu Jin and his Tusk clan. A graphic novel is planned to come out in 2024 through Marcosia Enterprises, Unleash the Pandemonium with artist Paul Cameron, as well as a card game, all to coincide with the release of the show. Keep in mind that Action Mice has been in production since 2017. It was probably delayed because of the conception of the Anthroverse, and then delayed again because of COVID. Given the size of the project, it's unclear if the two shows will see the light of day in 2024. The project is quite ambitious. It will include 17 properties like Action Mice, Panda Khan Unleash the Pandemonium, Enguard, Fire Frogs, Dino Knights, and many more. However, since Enguard will come out in a different network or streaming service, it's unlikely to be a part of the Anthroverse. Not all of them are exclusive to animation. Some are only for publications, toys, and or video games. Although publishing characters could cross over into animation and vice versa. Galestone partnered with Global Genesis Group, a company located in Nevada and California that produces indie movies and shows. Their goal is to rebuild the Saturday morning cartoons through streaming services, and to achieve that, they're making the cartoons that they thought they were watching when they were kids. While doing research for this video, I was surprised by how little was known about Galestone Media and its projects. And while I am a little skeptical about their chances of success, I hope they can rebuild Saturday morning cartoons. They sound really passionate about their creations, licensed characters, and stories and I'm really intrigued to see how it all turns out. Whatever happens with the animated show, it's nice to see Monica and Dave working on PandaCon again. Hopefully the upcoming interest in the property will allow them to continue expanding the original story on a regular basis. Thanks for watching!